Alan Wellbridge Ladd was an American actor and film and television producer. Ladd found success in film the 1940s and early 1950s, particularly in westerns and film noirs where he was often paired with Veronica Lake. His popularity diminished in the late 1950s, though he continued to appear in popular films until his accidental death due to a lethal combination of alcohol, a barbiturate, and two tranquilizers. Early life. Ladd was born in Hot Springs, Arkansas. He was the only child of Vina Raleigh and Alan Ladd, a freelance accountant. His mother was English, from County Durham. His father died when he was four, and his mother relocated to Oklahoma City, where she married Jim Beavers, a house painter. The family then moved again to the North Hollywood section of Los Angeles where Ladd became a high school swimming and diving champion and participated in high school dramatics at North Hollywood High School, including the role of Coco in The Mikado. He also appeared in an aquatic show, Marinella. Early career Ladd opened his own hamburger and malt shop across from the high school, which he called Tiny's Patio. His role in the Mikado had been seen by a talent scout. In August 1933 Ladd was one of a group of young discoveries signed to a long-term contract with Universal Pictures. The contract had options which could go for seven years but they were all in the studio's favor. Universal eventually decided he was too blonde and too short and dropped him after six months. Ladd went to work at Universal as a studio carpenter for two years. He got a letter from Ben Bard, who taught him when he was under contract at Universal, suggesting Ladd attend Bard's school. Ladd did so and appeared in several stage productions for Bard. He had short-term stints at MGM and RKO, but really made his mark on radio. Ladd's rich, deep voice was ideal for that medium and he ended up working three years at KFWB doing up to 20 shows a week. Sue Carroll Ladd was playing the roles of a father and son on radio one night when heard by the agent Sue Carroll. She was impressed and called the station to talk to the actors and was told it was the one person. She arranged to meet him and impressed by his looks she signed him to her books and enthusiastically promoted her new client in films as well as radio. Starting with the 1939 film Rulers of the Sea, in which he played a character named Colin Farrell, he also received attention for a small part in Hitler, Beast of Berlin. Ladd began appearing in dozens of films in small roles, such as her first romance, The Black Hat and the Disney film The Reluctant Dragon. Most notably he had a small part in Citizen Kane, playing a newspaper reporter towards the end of the film. Ladd's career then gained extra momentum when he was cast in a featured role in the wartime thriller Joan of Paris, 1942. It was only a small part but it involved a touching death scene which brought him attention within the industry. This gun for hire and stardom for his next role, Sue Carroll found a vehicle which made Ladd's career. The 1942 adaptation of Graham Greene's novel This Gun for Hire in which he played Raven, a hitman with a conscience, for director Frank Tuttle. Paramount signed Ladd to a long-term contract in September 1941. The New York Times reported shortly afterwards that Tuttle and the studio are showing more than a passing enthusiasm for Ladd. He has been trying to get a foothold in pictures for eight years but received no encouragement although he tried every angle known to town, extra, work, bit parts, stock contracts, dramatic schools, assault of the casting offices. Sue Carroll, the former silent star who is now an agent, undertook to advance the youth's career two years ago and only recently could she locate an attentive ear. Then the breaks began. Once Ladd had acquired an unsmiling hardness, he was transformed from an extra to a phenomenon. Ladd's calm, slender ferocity make it clear that he was the first American actor to show the killer as a cold angel. David Thompson both the film and Ladd's performance played an important role in the development of the gangster genre. That's the old-fashioned motion picture gangster with his ugly face, 
gaudy cars, and flashy clothes was replaced by a smoother, better-looking, and better-dressed bad man was largely the work of Mr. Ladd, New York Times obituary. Ladd was teamed with actress Veronica Lake in this film, and despite the fact that it was Robert Preston who played the romantic lead, the Ladd-Lake pairing captured the public's imagination, and would continue in another three films. Even during the filming of this gun for hire Paramount knew they had a potential star and announced Ladd's next film, an adaptation of Dashi L. Hammett's story The Glass Key. This had been a successful vehicle for George Raft several years earlier and Paramount wanted a surefire narrative to carry him on his way. The movie was Ladd's second pairing with Lake. His cool, unsmiling persona proved popular with wartime audiences and he was voted by the Motion Picture Herald as one of the ten stars of Tomorrow for 1942. Ladd then appeared in a lighter vehicle, Lucky Jordan, with Helen Walker, playing a gangster who tries to get out of war service and tangles with Nazis. His new status was reflected by the fact he the only actor billed above the title. He followed this with a more serious adventure story, China with Loretta Young for director John Farrow, with whom Ladd would make a number of movies. Ladd's next film was meant to be opposite Betty Hutton, Incendiary Blonde, but Ladd had to be inducted into the army on 18 January. Army service Ladd had a brief time out for military service in the United States Army Air Force's first motion picture unit. Ladd was initially classified 4F unfit for military service because of stomach problems, but began his military service in January 1943. He was posted to the Walla Walla Army Air Base at Walla Walla, Washington, attaining the rank of corporal. He attended the Oscars in March 1943 and in September appeared in a trailer promoting a war loan drive, Letter from a Friend. While Ladd was in the armed services, a number of films which had been announced for him were either postponed and or made with different actors including Incendiary Blonde, The Story of Dr. Wassel, Ministry of Fear and The Man in Half Moon Street. Paramount started promoting lad replacements such as Sonny Tufts and Barry Sullivan. Old lad films were reissued with him being given more prominent billing, such as Beast of Berlin. He was reportedly receiving 20,000 fan letters a week. The New York Times reported that Ladd in the brief period of a year and with only four starring pictures to his credit, had built up a following unmatched in film and history since Rudolph Valentino skyrocketed to fame. In December 1943 he would be listed as the 15th most popular star in the U.S. Ladd fell ill and went to military hospital in Santa Barbara for several weeks in October. On 28 October, he was given an honorable medical discharge because of a stomach disorder complicated by influenza. Return to filmmaking When Ladd returned from the army, Paramount announced a series of vehicles for him, including a Now Tomorrow and Two Years Before the Mast. And Now Tomorrow was a melodrama which reteamed him with Loretta Young and was co-written by Raymond Chandler. In March 1944 Ladd took another physical and was reclassified 1A. He would have to be re-inducted into the army, but her deferment was given to enable Ladd to make two years before the mast. He was meant to be re-inducted on 4 September 1944 but Paramount succeeded in getting this pushed back again to make Salty O'Rourke. He also found time to appear in a big-screen version of Duffy's Tavern. Paramount were unsure whether Ladd would be called back into the army or not so they kept him busy commissioning Raymond Chandler to write an original screenplay for him, The Blue Dahlia. This was his third teaming with Veronica Lake and his fourth with William Bendix and was written and made relatively quickly because Ladd was due for induction in May. However then General Lewis Hershey released all men 30 or over from duction in the arm and Ladd was free from the draft along with several other film stars freed from the draft call. He promptly enlisted with the Hollywood Victory Committee for the Entertainment Industry's overseas arm, volunteering to tour for USO shows. Ladd next made Calcutta, which reteamed him with John Farrow and William Bendix. 
Release for this film was also delayed. Suspension Lad was next meant to make California with Betty Hutton but he refused to report for work in August. The issue was money, Ladd was earning $150,000 minus $200,000 a year but he felt he deserved more. Paramount responded by suspending Ladd. The two parties reconciled in November with Ladd getting a salary increase. He was the 15th most popular star in the country. The following year saw the release of three successful Ladd films, two years before The Mast, The Blue Dali and OSS. In 1947 Ladd was ranked among the top 10 most popular stars in the U.S. That year saw the release of Calcutta and Wild Harvest, where he reteamed with Robert Preston. Following this was another film with Lake, Saigon, their last movie together and the least well-known. He then made a melodrama with Faro, Beyond Glory, which featured Audie Murphy in his film debut. Ladd formed his own production companies for film and radio and then starred in his own syndicated series Box 13, which ran from 1948-49. Ladd and Robert Preston starred in the 1948 Western film, Whispering Smith, which was his first Western and the first movie he made in color. The Great Gatsby Ladd's next role was a significant change of pace, playing Jay Gatsby in the 1949 version of of The Great Gatsby, written and produced by Richard Maybaum. It was not a big success at the box office and its mixed critical reception caused Ladd to shy away from serious dramatic roles afterwards. Ladd's next films were more typical fare. Chicago Deadline, playing a tough reporter, Captain Carey, USA, as a vengeful ex-os agent, for Maybaum, branded, a popular western, and appointment with danger, as a postal inspector investigating a murder with the help of nun Phyllis Calvert. In 1950 the Hollywood Women's Press Club voted Ladd the easiest male star to deal with in Hollywood. Leaving Paramount, Shane in 1951, Ladd announced that he would leave Paramount and make five films for Warner Brothers. His contract with Paramount was amended so he could only make two more films for that studio, but this did not happen. His final four movies for Paramount were Red Mountain, Thunder in the East, Shane and Botany Bay. Although Ladd left Paramount in 1952, the release of his final films was staggered. Shane and Botany Bay did not come out until 1953. Ladd later said that leaving Paramount was a big upset for him, and that he only left for business reasons, future security for the children and ourselves. Shane, in which he played the title character, was particularly popular. It premiered at Radio City Music Hall in New York City in April 1953, grossing over $114,000 in its four weeks there, and in all earned $8 million in North America over its initial run, and led to Ladd being voted one of the ten most popular stars in the country in 1953. Warner's Brothers, Universal Lad's deal with Warner's was for one film a year for ten years, starting from when his contract with Paramount expired. He was guaranteed $150,000 per film against 10% of the gross, making him one of the best-paid stars in Hollywood. His first film for Warner Brothers was The Iron Mistress. The arrangement with Warners was not exclusive however, enabling him to work for other studios. He made a movie at Universal Studios, Desert Legion, with Ladd as a member of the French Foreign Legion Warwick Films when former agent Albert R. Broccoli formed Warwick Films with his partner Irving Allen. They heard Ladd was unhappy with Paramount and was leaving the studio. With his wife and agent Sue Carroll, they negotiated for Ladd to appear in the first three of their films made in England and released through Columbia Pictures. The Red Beret, Hell Below Zero, based on the Hammond Innes book The White South and The Black Knight. All three were co-written by Ladd's regular screenwriter Richard Maybaum, the last with additional dialogue by Brian Forbes. 
In between Hell Below Zero and The Black Knight, Ladd made Saskatchewan for Universal in Canada. This meant Ladd spent 19 months out of the U.S. and did not have to pay tax on his income for that period. Jaguar Productions When Ladd returned to Hollywood in 1954 he formed a new production company, Jaguar Productions, who would release through Warner Brothers. He also contracted with Warner Brothers to make some films solely as an actor. His first film for Jaguar was Drumbeat, a western directed by Delma Daves which was reasonably successful at the box office. For Warners themselves he then made The McConnell Story, co-starring June Allison, which also proved popular. He followed this with one for Jaguar, Hell on Frisco Bay, then one for Warners, Santiago. For Jaguar, Ladd produced but did not appear in A Cry in the Night. Later he did play a role in The Big Land for Jaguar. He turned down the chance to play the role of Jet Rink in the 1956 film, Giant, which became one of the biggest hits of the decade. Ladd then received an offer to star in a film being made at 20th Century Fox Boy on a Dolphin. Back at Warner's he did the Deep Six for Jaguar. The Proud Rebel was made independently for Samuel Goldwyn, Jr., and co-starred Ladd's son David. Delma Daves hired Ladd to make The Badlanders, which like many of Ladd's films around this time was a box office disappointment. Later films for Walter Myrish at United Artists Ladd appeared in The Man in the Net. He then he produced but did appear in Island of Lost Women. He produced and appeared in Guns of the Timberland, then made All the Young Men with Sidney Poitier that was released through Columbia. One foot in hell over at 20th Century Fox saw Ladd play an out-and-out -out villain for the first time since the beginning of his career, but the result was not popular with audiences. He followed the path of many Hollywood stars on the decline and made a peplum in Italy, Jewel of Champions. Back in Hollywood he made 13 West Street as a star and producer for his new company, Ladd Enterprises. In November 1962, Ladd was found lying unconscious in a pool of blood with a bullet wound near his heart, in what might have been an unsuccessful suicide attempt. In 1963, Ladd's career looked set to make a comeback when he filmed a supporting role in The Carpetbaggers which became one of the most popular films of 1964. He would not live to see its release. Height Few biographical sources refrain from speculation on Ladd's height, which legend contends was slight. Reports of his height vary from 5 feet 5 in to 5 feet 9 in, with 5 feet 6 in being the most generally accepted today. His U.S. Army enlistment record, however, indicates a height of 5 feet 7 in. Ladd and Veronica Lake became a particularly popular pairing because, at 5 feet 1 inch, she was one of the few Hollywood actresses shorter than him. In his memoirs, actor, producer John Houseman wrote of Ladd, since he himself was extremely short, he had only one standard by which he judged his fellow players, their height. To compensate for Ladd's height, during the filming of Boy on a Dolphin, co-starring the much taller Sophia Loren, the cinematographer used special low stands to light Ladd and the crew built a ramp system of heavy planks to enable the two actors to stand at equal eye level. In outdoor scenes, trenches were dug for Loren to stand in. For the film Saskatchewan, director Raoul Walsh had a six-inch hole dug for co-star Hugh O'Brien to stand in, while using the excavated dirt to build a mound for Ladd to stand on, thereby overcoming the one-foot disparity in height. Personal life Ladd married a high school sweetheart, Marjorie Jane Midge Harold, in October 1936. Their only child, a son named Alan Ladd, Jr., was born on October 22, 1937. They divorced in July 1941. Ladd's mother committed suicide in front of him. On March 15, 1942, Ladd married his agent and manager, former film actress Sue Carroll in Mexico City. 
They intended to be remarried in the USA in July because Ladd's divorce from his first wife was not final. Ladd and Carol had two children, Alana and David Allen. Alan Ladd, Jr. is a film executive and producer and founder of The Ladd Company. Actress Alana Ladd, who co-starred with her father in Guns of the Timberland and Duel of Champions is married to the veteran talk radio broadcaster Michael Jackson. Actor David Ladd, who co-starred with his father as a child in The Proud Rebel, was married to Charlie's Angel star Cheryl Ladd, 1973-80. Their daughter is actress Jordan Ladd. Death On January 29, 1964, Ladd was found dead in his Palm Springs home. His death due to cerebral edema caused by an acute overdose of alcohol and three other drugs was ruled accidental. Ladd suffered from chronic insomnia and regularly used sleeping pills and alcohol to induce sleep. While he had not taken a lethal amount of any one drug, the combination apparently caused a synergistic reaction that proved fatal. He was buried in the Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Glendale, California. Not until June 28, 1964 did carpetbaggers producer Joseph E. Levine hold an elaborate premiere screening in New York City with an after-party staged by his wife at the Four Seasons restaurant. Ladd has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame at 1601 Vine Street. His handprint appears in the forecourt of Grauman's Chinese Theatre in Hollywood. In 1995, a Golden Palm star on the Palm Springs Walk of Stars was dedicated to him. Select radio credits. Lincoln Highway. Musically inclined for Silver Theatre with Judy Garland. One Way Right to Nowhere for Suspense. Ladd appeared as Chicago-based private detective Tom Dwyer in Robert L. Richard's story, The One Way Right to Nowhere, on the suspense radio series with an air date of October 6, 1944. Another suspense appearance by Ladd as defendant Robert Tasker in the story, The Defense Rests, aired on March 9, 1944. The story was written by Roland Brown and Robert L. Richards. Regular series box 13, 52 episodes.